here we are nearing the end of the year. So of course we've got things like Black Friday coming up. It's the Christmas holiday shopping season. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of discounts and sales on all sorts of consumer electronics. But then that brings us to next year, 2025, which is kind of surprising to be saying that already. January, CES, usually in Las Vegas. I think it's in Las Vegas every year. CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. We've got Panasonic holding some kind of keynote, a big keynote in 2025. We'll see. We've got 4-3 rumors asking, is there still hope for a new camera from Panasonic? Now, Panasonic, for the longest time, had their cinema line of Panasonic cameras, but for over 20 years now, they've had the Lumix cameras. If you're familiar with my channel, you know how big of a fan I am of the Lumix cameras. And if you're in the know, you would know that that's a Panasonic brand, but if you just saw the camera and it said, you saw it said Lumix, you'd have no idea it was Panasonic unless you really dug down into the corporation and how everything's structured. Now, what's interesting about this is I think there was a CES a few years ago, and maybe my memory's not as good as it used to be, but I'm pretty sure there was a CES where they said they were working on certain things as it related to cameras and their photography development kind of stuff, those types of projects, but I don't think they actually announced any particular model. So I would assume that this is probably gonna be the same thing. And in fact, if we look over here on the actual press release, this talks a lot about sustainability, the environment, climate change, that kind of stuff. It's not really a photography event at all, more like microwaves and razor blades or whatever else Panasonic is working on these days. They have a lot of products in the consumer space and the, in the electronic space, and I'm a big fan of their cameras. And if you're watching this, you probably are too, but I wouldn't expect anything in January. I think this is probably something different. What are the, maybe we'll be surprised. I'll be excited if they do announce something. I've been eagerly anticipating the S1H Mark II. The S1H is a very, uh, I don't want to say popular. It, it definitely has its fan base, but it's not widespread popularity like you get with Canon or Sony. But Lumix definitely has its loyal uh, enthusiasts, its dedicated fan base. I would consider myself one of, one of them. Lately, I've been shooting with the Lumix S5 Mark II, the Lumix GH7, the Lumix G9 Mark II. A lot of the latest and greatest from Lumix, I think are some of the best cameras ever made. I think I've been able to do more with the newest uh, Lumix cameras than I, I could ever have imagined just you know five or 10 years ago. It's pretty incredible what these cameras are able to do nowadays when it comes to photo and video but I am very excited for an S1H Mark II, kind of a refresh, relaunch of the S1 line. It's been, gosh, over six years or something like that for the S1 line, the S1, the S1R, the S1H. We could definitely use an upgrade when it comes to the Lumix full frame, kind of flagship S1 series. I am excited to try the S9. I made a video recently talking about the Lumix S9 and why I kind of like that compact, pocketable, even though if it's got a lens on it, it's not really pocketable, but pocketable camera body. I like that in theory, but it is missing some small pancake lenses to complement the compact nature of the S9. But it was quite reassuring in the comments. I had a lot of people saying that the S9, they weren't dealing with any kind of overheating or issues with the camera shutting down. Now, I'm in a more unique environment where a lot of times I'm filming outside, being in Arizona, it does get quite hot. Not this time of year, but certainly over the summer, it gets quite warm here. So overheating is something that's very uh, near and dear to my heart and, and having a camera or a device that does not overheat. I've also made a video talking about that why I think it's so irritating that we have all these electronics nowadays just overheating because they don't have the right thermal management built in. But the S9 isn't really the, the big splash that Lumix could have in the camera world. It's very popular if you're doing you know street photography or travel vlogging or something like that, where you need a more compact camera. But I think for any ecosystem to be successful, you need the flagship, you need the pinnacle, you need the thing that everything else is kind of building up towards because even if you're getting into a, a camera system, like in the Lumix case with the L-mount, if you're investing in, in something like the Lumix S9 and getting it at a cheaper level, I think at a certain point you start to look of, what can I get next? How can I upgrade? And the S5 Mark II is a great camera, but even that is getting 
kind of a little bit older now where it's it's not uh, cutting edge anymore. It still does everything I could ever want and hope and dream to do, but something like an S1H Mark II really could push us to that next level where we're actually getting new features, new technology, hopefully things keep getting better and better, right? Every every year Apple comes out with a new iPhone that's better than the last one and there's some shady business practices there maybe behind the scenes where where they're phasing out older models intentionally to get you to upgrade to the new stuff. But in general, technology does progress. We do do things do get better unless you're talking about the Atomos Shinobi 2, in which case I would say opt for the Mark 1 version because the Mark 2 is not that great. But I digress. That's a whole nother video you can go watch. In this case, I think for a healthy camera ecosystem, you need the entry consumer level product all the way up to the high end. I think that's where you see Sony really making the biggest waves and the most impact by offering camera bodies and, and lenses at all price points, at all entry points. So if you're a seasoned professional, you can easily find Sony equipment that fits your style. And if you're just getting started and you're looking for a cheap camera just to start filming something beyond what your phone can do, Sony also offers that. And the you know the the paths to upgrading and to growing in the ecosystem are are very strong and it's very obvious what you would get with something like a Sony camera and that whole lineup versus even Canon has done an okay job in that regard but still it's a little bit more unclear i think they have a lot of middle of the road stuff they do have their nice you know big tentpole feature rich cameras the R5 Mark II i believe is kind of their latest and greatest but you also have a lot of stuff that's just kind of middle of the road, prosumer, consumer, and it's, it's harder to differentiate what's the difference between an R6 and R7 and an R8, especially when you start getting into the Mark I, Mark II variants. I think Nikon has a similar problem where they have so many, so many variations of more or less the same thing, and you're really wondering like, do I get the APS-C version? Do I get the full frame version? Which is which is actually going to give me the best bang for my buck? And then there ends up being kind of that clear winner where everyone kind of says, yeah, that's that's the best one. It's It's got the most features for the price point and everything else just kind of fades into the background. You don't really notice it that much other than it just cluttering up your Amazon feed as you're searching for different cameras. I think that's kind of where I personally see Canon and Nikon. If you're in the know and you're you know huge fans of both of those companies, you probably have a much better understanding Understanding of all the ins and outs and the intricacies of what makes this one better than that one. But as someone who's more uh, less enthusiastic, let's say, about uh, the, the prospect of adopting Canon or Nikon, it's a little confusing, I think, all the skews and, and the differences and what qualifies what. And, and Sony is kind of in that camp as well, but for some reason, their, their product lineup just seems a lot clearer to me as, a, as an outsider, someone who's not familiar with every single camera they make. Uh, it still is kind of um, at the surface level, kind of obvious what's, who, what's catered to who, and you can kind of decipher it quickly where, where Canon and Nikon tend to muddy the features so much over so many different models that you really start to wonder like, why am I paying $2,000 more for this one than that one? And then somewhere buried deep on the spec sheet, there'll be the the little item that explains why that one is the, the better one or why that one's the cheaper one. And you can really have to go into the weeds to, to figure all that out. For whatever reason, the Lumix cameras have always made sense to me. They're pretty cut and dry. I think the S1 lineup, was probably like the most confusing that they've they've gotten in terms of having an S1, S1R, and an S1H. I think the moment you start having that many multiples and then now you're talking about a Mark II, a Gen 2 version of potentially those same cameras, that's where an outsider might be a little confused. But as a as just a casual, you know, consumer, if you're just looking at like, hey, what what's a good camera to get? I feel like Lumix keeps the lineup pretty tight. There's only a handful of things that really make sense as far as like their new stuff. I've always loved that about the GH cameras. I gosh, I don't even know. Is there a G? Well, they 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 kind of sc screwed it up. The GH line fell behind. It used to be the G1 and the uh, the GH1. Yeah, the GH1 and the G1. And then somewhere along the line, they ended up with the G9 Mark II as at the same point really as the GH7 which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when it come you're know, talking about numerically but you know if you if you're following along it's pretty easy to tell what the new latest and greatest stuff from Lumix is cuz they just don't have as many offerings but the ones they do offer are quite feature rich and I do think are very strong when it terms when it comes to 
price to value and, and all that kind of stuff where you're actually getting the most from these devices compared to some of the other brands that just seem like they're always like leaving things out unnecessarily or adding stuff in that you don't really need. And it, it ends up making it really hard to determine like which, which one of these things do I even get? So we'll see what they do this year at CES. I guess it's technically next year at CES, but early next year, I will not hold my breath. I don't think anything crazy is going to come in terms of photography announcements, but you know, that who, who am I to say? Maybe I'm completely wrong and I would gladly be wrong in this case because I would love to see some new stuff from Panasonic, from Lumix, and really putting more out there in terms of what it means to be a Lumix shooter, what it means to buy L-mount lenses. If you're investing in lenses for the L-mount, you want to know that there's a future there. You want to know that you can use that glass on something pocketable like the S9 or use that same lens potentially on something really beefy and robust like an S1H Mark II. I will uh, casually wait and see what happens because it definitely is time and I think everyone's wondering where is the S1H Mark II. There's a few people wondering where the S1 Mark II is. But regardless, we'll see what happens and hopefully we'll have some news sooner rather than later.